Applecaster is live. So we're here to talk about the characters you're going to be creating for the A for C one shot. The chief's quite uh, kindly stepped in to fill a vacant player spot. So it's, it's all a bit last minute for the chief because he sprang out of bed mm -hmm. half an hour ago with a fully formed character sheet gripped in his hands. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Okay, so we've already chatted a bit just before Jenny came on, and we've basically we've got the rough sort of character or ideas of what people are planning to play. We've got Rob, who is doing a sort of elven captain of the research vessel that you're on. We've got Johannes, who is doing an orcish engineer and perhaps magical practitioner. We've got John Drury, who is going for a, a human medic. And we've got Tashif, who is going for a sort of space archaeologist who is a goblin. Now, Jenny, have you a had time to look at the a space goblin? What other type of goblin is there? <laughs> so, have you had time to look at the player handout, Jenny? Yes, and I told you what kind of character I wanted to play. I, I, have, I have slept since then, so I would ask you if you can remind me. Um, I'm going to have to remind myself of the actual um, species. I think it might have been an elf, but I definitely wanted it to be uh, magical orientated in the uh, the frost. School of Magic, or whatever you want to call it. Okay. And have you given any thought as to what sort of particular niche you might occupy on the ship? Like I said, we've pretty much got a, a captain, an engineer, a medic, and an archaeologist. I moment. suggested the co-pilot. Well, I don't think we can have a regular pilot yet. So I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <So you can laughs> be the pilot. I, I just assumed that the captain was the was the pilot as well. <laughs> okay, well, I should be the pilot then. Okay, I just so. push buttons and talk to people. <laughs> oh, I also get to make out with the hot alien women. Also, when shit hits the fan, it's all your fault. So that's right. It's, right. <laughs> it's what Kirk taught me anyway. Okay, so as I say, guys, first things first is aspects for the characters, and the first one is a high concept, which is a brief sentence that sums up who your character is and the place they occupy on board the ship. Now, just to give you a brief rundown of the background again, all of the species that exist in this game universe originated on this world called Homeworld, imaginatively enough. This world was effectively decimated by the equivalent of a, a sort of magical battle for supremacy, and it was reduced to pretty much a blasted wasteland. Now, this looked like it was spelling doom for all of the civilised races until a mage discovered a way to make these aether ships, this mage Albus Fletcher. He invented these aether ships that were capable of travelling through the aether or space, if you prefer, and it allowed all of these races to spread out into the universe beyond them, colonise unspoiled worlds. At the same time as this happening, all of the gods of Homeworld were believed to have died or perished, perhaps in this magical battle, perhaps in something unrelated, no one's quite sure. There were some people, though, however, who said that, well, since the gods were supposed to live elsewhere in their sort of celestial realms, and now people had gained access to the heavens, they should be able to go out and find them and discover what happened to them. Now, unfortunately, despite many people sending off Aether ships to the various different parts of the universe, no one actually was able to discover what had happened to the gods. Recently, a deep Aether spellcasters union vessel a survey vessel has discovered this huge gate inscribed with the names of many of the old forgotten gods floating deep in the void realizing that they didn't have the facilities to actually deal with it themselves since they're just a survey vessel they sent a message back to their superiors who sent a single experimental vessel to investigate it crammed with the the cream of the crop the finest of the fine and that is where you guys come in. You are this reinforcement ship sent along to back up the, the survey vessel. If possible, discover what this gate is, whether it poses a threat, and whether it can be used to determine what happened to the gods. So that's the rough background. So before we get any further into creating the characters. As John said just before we went online, we need to come up with a name for the ship which you are all sailing on. Now I'm quite prepared to leave this entirely in the hands of the players. Obviously I wanted to wait till Rob got back because he is the captain of the ship so he'd probably have some sort of input into the name of the vessel. 
Yeah, I'm 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 happy to be democratic. My only request is not not silly or contemporary. So, so my plan of calling it the SS Cthulhu is out then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so do any of you guys have any ideas as to what name you might like to give this aid to ship this vessel? Well, I guess I guess for me, where I would start with would be, you know, whose ship is this? Is it is it Rob's ship that's kind of got press ganged? In which case, then I'd like to know a little bit more about what Rob might think about it. Or was it a ship given to us by uh, the Royal... Uh, Hegemony, which is the big government, to we're just crewing it so that we can go. We're like the only crew available, so they're giving us a ship and going yeah, kind of a thing. It, effectively, or? it's a it's a ship that's been created by the the Spellcasters Union, who have right. very very close ties with the Royal Hegemony, who right. are the sort of main human empire who control much of the the universe because yeah. they've got all the patents for the Aether ships <clears> and all that technology that anyone who truly understand it. So it's an experimental vessel that's been created by them. It's yeah. capable of being crewed by a much smaller crew, i.e. you guys, than a normal vessel of this size would require. Yeah. So I guess to me then, my, my mind, my logic would be been, like, okay. Like At least <laughs> I've been assigned to be captain. Yeah. Chosen, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah, but I think I'm thinking then we want to start with something like that kind of fits with the mission, you know, because this ship's been designed for this mission to do this thing, you know, this hunt okay. for the gods sort of a thing. So we might want to like, you know, think about that, you know. Okay, no, I think that's a, a very good idea. So does it, just to throw it out there, does anyone have any ideas they want to suggest? I see Johannes has suggested the mm -hmm. the Unity or the HMS New Dawn. In the chat window, I don't know if anyone has any other suggestions they want to throw into the ring. Um, I'm just trying. To, I, I, I just would like to get something in there. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think. I wouldn't mind trying to get something in there, like perhaps like uh, having to do with the idea that this is like sort of like a almost like a, like we're reaching out to them, or you know, we're trying to. Uh, yeah, um, this is a message that we're trying to send. Yeah. And you know, it's also know like a last desperate hope, isn't it? You know what I mean? Like, well, it's the you're absolutely right. It's the first tangible evidence that has been recovered since the Exodus from Homeworld that the potentially some vestige of the gods is still out there. Because previous to this, nothing has been discovered. It's all drawn a blank. This is the first tangible evidence that the gods did exist in the Aether in some capacity. Yeah, so like since we're searching then, maybe, for the yeah. gods in space, uh -huh. I know this doesn't quite sound like a sh sound like a ship name, but the Chariot of the Gods. It's just as a reference to a a book that was written before that Alien Sky, where someone was suggesting that um, uh, the gods were like from space. Yeah, except. This isn't a chariot of the gods. It's it's a chariot to take us to the gods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was built. It wasn't built by gods, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost in a way, almost like a very tangible uh, prayer in a way, you know. Okay. Yeah, and this is a ship we'd all be fairly new to, since it's a one of a kind, recent thing that John say was a prototype. Yeah, indeed, it is a prototype. Yeah. I'm just going through my thesaurus here. That's all good. It's just, I guess I'm just trying to get into the minds of whoever created this vessel, uh, what, their, what their thoughts on its purpose were, what their hopes for it were, because a lot of times that sort of helps when naming something. Yeah, you know I mean, mean, basically, the, the sort of idea of the people who created it is that, obviously, the Royal Hagamony takes an awful lot of administration and sort of legwork to run because it covers all these different worlds. Now, even for something as potentially valuable as this gateway, which may turn out to be nothing after all, they can't risk sending all of their fleet of Aether ships to investigate this because that would leave them nothing to run the rest of their civilization. So, effectively, they've created this single vessel with the idea of, well, if, if it does turn out to be nothing, there's only one vessel out there, whereas if it does turn out to be valuable, they obviously stocked it as much as they can with scientific apparatus, stuff like that. It's a lot tougher than your 
your standard ship of this size as well as being able to function with a fraction of the crew. Uh, Jenny, Jenny just suggested the Oracle. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like that a lot because that actually has a lot of uh, good connotations to what we're actually doing. Um, we're trying to be that receptacle for which the the truth of the gods will come back into this kind of universe. So that 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 would work for me if no one else. I have no objections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah fine, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So the ship can be called the Oracle then. Yeah, I like that. Splendid. Maybe it was um, maybe it was named by like. Uh, by like a group of people, like maybe I, I don't know. You tell me, John. But maybe the lore, the fact that we might find this gateway to the gods became public knowledge, and so maybe they, you know, put out to the public like NASA does sometimes. What do you think we should call this? Shit? Maybe that's the people who came up with the name. Yeah, that's quite an interesting idea that they've um, <laughs> they've told people that this mission is being launched. And effectively, the people have named it. I quite like that. Right, that down. Okay, so another thing for you guys to think about when you're creating your characters and your aspects, well, it doesn't have to be specifically stated in your aspects is what your particular characters bring to this mission i.e. why you've been selected for this mission oh I was thinking if I'm a researcher perhaps uh, archaeologist perhaps I know the old ways on homeland of how they worshipped the gods so maybe like a divine interpreter mm -hmm. that's cool For my character, it would be um, the hegemony would have faith in me to get them to this gate because, you know, I've got a lot of experience in space. So, and so it's your, your sort of veteran status that's meant you've been yes. for this mission. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very reliable head captain. And oh, for me personally, my trouble, in fact, is must know the minds of the gods. There was a little bit of mention of elven lore in the book. And how they were once more in touch with the divine, and um, so I saw them as seeking to, you know, reconnect that sort of elven to divinity connection. Yeah, the the elves of the setting did feel the the loss of the divine more sort of personally and more keenly than many of the other races, because they had well, obviously every race had their sort of their priests etc. who had a connection with the divine, whereas the elves to some extent all of their race had this. This connection, it was almost like a part of themselves had disappeared when the gods disappeared. Right. So maybe all the years and decades he's been a captain and remained a captain, you know, and maybe he was offered other positions, was in the course of doing his work, doing the SCU's work, he was gathering bits and pieces of information on, you know, rumors, tidbits, myths about, you know, the gods might still existing. And you know, he's. He's thrilled. You know, he would have insisted hard to make sure he was part of this mission. Sounds good tonight. Also, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the SCU and the Hegemony. Yeah, by the way, for right. those of us who are over here in uh, in England, I hope we're all enjoying the the fireworks going on outside of our windows. Mm -hmm. Oh, Indeed. why is that? Except it's raining as well. Oh yeah, I know. It's a shitty day. Oh, it's is it Guy Fox Day. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. was yesterday for me. Yeah, says the future spaceman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't. Uh, it's not celebrated over here. So. Oh really? Yeah, Guy Fox. I would say that probably. No one knows about that, that, really. <laughs> Six out of ten people wouldn't know what I was talking yeah, exactly. about. Exactly. Uh -huh. Okay, and so if you show them the mask, sure. they'll think. And, and two out of the ten, two out of the four that know only know because of that, because of V for Fifth Day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so give you a bit more information about the Royal Hegemony. 
basically they are a group of human kingdoms who when the exodus from homeworld began they united together with the the precursors of the spellcasters union which is the organization founded by albus fletcher the inventor of the aether ships and because they united together they were able to control a vast area of this aether space compared to a lot of the little empires who went their separate ways, like the orc tribes, etc. And they created this vast sort of loosely affiliated empire that controls this area that's now become known as Royal Space. They right, pretty but they don't control, control all the space. There's certainly no, large they, sections that's beyond them. Right? They certainly don't control all the space. Beyond Royal Space, there's hundreds of systems, some of which are controlled by, like, petty warlords. Some are controlled by, like, independent colonists just seeking to get by, some by barbaric orc tribes who went off to do their own thing. The main reason they have power is that they've effectively maintained something of a lockdown on the creation of these Aethercraft. So effectively everyone who wants to use Aethercraft has to deal with them or steal from them to a certain extent. It's like a lot of the um, the sort of orc warlords and tribes on the sort of outskirts. The part of the reason they raid and attack other ships is so they can take other ships, and they've actually got ships they can use. Okay, so moving on to the characters. As I say, the first thing is your high concept for your aspect, which is a brief sentence that sums up who your character is and the place they occupy. So yours was veteran SCU captain or something similar, wasn't it, Rob? That's right. That's correct. I can post my sheet again if that helps. Mm -hmm. All right. So I don't know what the rest of you guys are thinking of doing for your high concepts. Brilliant goblin space archaeologist. Excellent, that's a fine aspect. This mine. Jenny's is a fearless pilot who has navigated the length and breadth of the galaxy. It is that's called the galaxy, right, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Space galaxy. Obviously, as with all aspects, the best aspects have both a plus side and a negative side. So potentially for for Jenny's because she's fearless, perhaps that leads her to getting into mm, yeah. situations that a more level-headed person might sort of draw back from, or perhaps because you've known the length and the breadth of the galaxy. That can obviously be a very positive thing, but it can also be a negative thing as well, so that's a great example of an aspect. Do you, um, do you want us to have known each other prior to this, or not know each other, or something in between? Well, obviously, we do have a, a sort of default reason for you all being on the ship. I, you've all been hired or employed to go on this mission. So, if you guys well, want you said to, you were the best of the best, so I oh, yeah, exactly. we were selected mainly for our skills. Yeah, of course. So, if you guys want it to just simply be right, you've all been brought together for this mission. You're going on this mission. That's absolutely fine. If you want to have more close ties with other player characters, which could potentially lead to some interesting role play that's also great and I'd probably suggest you represent that in one or more of your aspects so if you do want to have close ties with another PC have a chat to that person like now or whatever and work out how you can have an aspect that reflects how you've got to know each other so uh, just as a random example Rob might have uh, the chief's character helped him out by deciphering one of the one of the relics of the gods that he discovered, or something on those lines. Just give a random example. Okay. Well, how does everybody feel about that? Do you want connections? Not want connections? Um, uh, I'm fine with connections. Uh... Okay. One of the. I'm happy either way as long as it's not forced. Right? Yeah, one one of the typical ways to create connections in Fate is you decide on some sort of precursor adventure or mission that your your character was on and you take an aspect to reflect that then the other PC will decide on how they like played a supporting role within that mission or whatever it might happen to be and they take an aspect to reflect their role in that okay 
John, if you if it's not a pain for you, can you post just a, a quick summary, character name, concept, character name, concept, character name, and then I'll put that on my sheet, and then I can maybe start thinking about connections and stuff like that. So was that addressed to me, Rob? Sorry, up. Yes. Your sound yeah. skipped out there. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was wondering if you could maybe post in chat something where it says each person's name and just their high concept, just so I know the position, and then from there, I mean, I would have a true poster, first of all, but from there I would be able to start thinking about connections. Just give me a second. What I'll actually do is I will set up a Google Doc, which I can effectively link to, which I should be able to make so that you can all go in and like add to it all. Should we add like uh, the important information about why we are on the ship? So like your high concepts, uh, why you were chosen for this role and uh, that sort of thing. So we have all that in one place. Yeah, it certainly wouldn't hurt to do that, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to be updating this Google Doc now. So. I've got Rob. What's your character name, Rob? I believe it's Dantalus Kalein. Dantalus Kalein. Dantalus Kalein. And you're a veteran SCU captain. Yeah, health. Okay. Then we've got Johannes. What were you thinking for your character name? I'm still working on it. Names are usually the most difficult thing for me. Do you have any thoughts with regard to your high concept? Yeah, it's the hotshot engine wizard. Um, How about yourself, John? Uh, he's gone. All right. He's just offended. Yeah. No problems. I will jump to you. Go in first. I will jump to you then, for Shafe. Have you had any thoughts as to your character uh, name? Kratos Moore. Put it in the chat. And I will post my high concept. Excuse me. Okay, so brilliant goblins. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that feat sheet. I can just do it there. Hmm. Were there any like name suggestions on the hangout you gave us? There weren't any name suggestions, no. Oh, okay. If what? you want to go with something with more medieval flair, I have a great website you can use. Uh, what's your it. race? Well, what, what, I, I was going to be an elf, so what kind of ah. flame would that be in this setting? It's not very specific, I don't think, unfortunately. No. Okay, so it, as long as it's kind of... Kind of like old school y. Yeah. Long and, and uh, elaborate. Yeah, as, as, long, as long as it's sort of something that would seem appropriate to a sort of fantasy. Yeah. I, yeah. All right, cool. I, yeah. I put in the chat uh, a good link for uh, old school names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> that helps me out a lot, especially when I'm doing something with a more fantasy bent to it. It, it does mention names in the lore, if you're, if you're interested. Uh, but I, I eschewed their recommendation yeah. because I didn't like Yeah, it. some of them aren't exactly brilliant, to be honest. That's why I didn't copy them over into the slap together, yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. it's, what I'm it gonna, suggests is very fantasy -based. I'm going to post the link to the Google Doc now in the chat, which should allow you, Ooh, if you click on it, to thing. all go in and actually edit it. I'm in it at the moment. I've basically just put down each person a space for their high concept and obviously the name after the, the IC name after the person's name. Do you want to spot all aspects there? Yeah, if you want to add in the rest of your aspects, that would certainly be very handy from whoever's showing up as the anonymous gopher on my version of the, the Google Doc. Not me. Don't I share it to one person. It suddenly has a whole bunch of random people. I, I, I can see that Rob's shown up as an anonymous chinchilla. I think it's Rob. What am I? You're you're the gopher. Uh, we have to write stuff in, okay. Yeah. 
the storm in me now. And then because you should all be able to see this, you'll be able to have a look and get more of an idea of what the other people are playing, rather than us keep posting it in the chat and it keeps scrolling mm -hmm. up the top and us having to search for it. It should make it a little bit easier. What's um, what's my animal, John? You're an orangutan. I'm an orangutan. Yeah, I wasn't, worse. I wasn't going to say anything because it seemed a little bit impolite. But... <laughs> What about me? <clears throat> you are a camel. Ah. <laughs> and your animal thing is... Okay, connection to the ship. Indeed, yeah, while you guys are typing that, just to give you a reminder of what the aspect should be. It should be high concept, which is a brief sentence summary of who your character is. The trouble, which is their major source of complication. <laughs> then it should be the background, which is something about where you're from, whether you're an Alba Nova, noble in exile from a rich forest moon, oh, or an outcast orc pilot. Your fourth one should be an aspect that ties your character to the ship, something both you and the vessel have in common. And then your last one is a free aspect, which can be whatever you wish it to be. Oh, okay. And um, if you if you wanted to have a connection with another PC, I'd say that'd probably be the one to use for it. Which one? The ship one? No, the free one. Okay. Okay, so that, then the troubles. So what did I put as the troubles? Can you just repeat the other two aspects? Uh, that isn't the, the last. One. The last two. Yeah. Background and ship. Background and uh, affiliation with ship. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I was expecting the chief to put a sort of like a space asteroid controller or something similar. <laughs> it's difficult to come up with a connection to a ship that we just got. Well, I'm going with, for me, I'm going with just saying what more or less what my role on the ship is for that aspect. Yeah, like um, why you were chosen. Yeah, why you're there or what you're doing, what's your role, so to speak. Because yeah, none of us own this ship technically, so it's uh, not like we have an intimate connection to it or whatever, yeah? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what about crew size, John? I mean, is this a ship that's capable with the, a crew of five is sufficient, or there's yeah, pretty much the, the, the part pilot. of the part of the ship being a prototype is that it can run with just you guys as the crew. Right. So, uh, who's wearing a red shirt? <laughs> no. Sadly, we don't have any red shirts. We're we're gonna need to. That sounds like a trouble aspect to me. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's trouble. I'm, I'm wearing a red shirt. Imagine one of the characters suddenly looking down, like seeing this red shirt, and be like, "Wait a minute!" <laughs> hey, so am I must study. No, not again. <laughs> I don't even have a name tag. <laughs> you can imagine, like, if he's aware of that, he would just try to state his backstory and goals to try make make his story compelling, so he wouldn't immediately die. I, I always imagined that. Love to have seen an episode of like Star Trek where one of the sort of ensigns wearing like the red shirt was just like, stood next to an engineer, and he's like, "I suppose you fancy swapping shirts over just before we go on this away mission." And the engineer being like, "No, no, no, it's fine. I will stick with this nicer." Non red one. It's a, yeah. There's a, there's a, somebody in a red shirt, somebody in a blue shirt. Hey, you want to switch? Trade you. Okay, so let's see how everyone's getting on with that. Hey, we don't have to actually save or anything like that. We just type the stuff in and leave it as is, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Fantastic. Then what, what we'll do is when the, I'll have this open, which will be very handy for me for obviously for like compelling you guys and knowing what your aspects are. You won't have to worry about putting them on the screen or anything like that. 
and when we start the actual session i'll post the link again in the chat so anyone who wants to can also have that open to some can suggest compels for other people oh i forgot to write my name in hold on a second i go back into that thing you want that in there right Yeah, I'll fill in my aspects in the feet roller, and then an hour into the session, I'll get disconnected and I'll go blank. <laughs> that, that's it, man. It, it, it always happens. So having like a separate document open, it's fairly easy if someone gets knocked down and comes back in. The yeah, I always write that stuff down on a separate sheet myself. Yeah. you gotta got to have it in front of you or else, yeah. You it's just, it's just a nice bit of redundancy there for if, yeah. uh, if, if someone does get booted out and has to jump back in, they don't have to suddenly stop and go, oh, wait a minute, I've got to spend about 15 minutes typing all my aspects in again. So John, you mentioned uh, uh, you mentioned earlier one thing you wanted to know was if there's anything in particular people wanted to see. Yep. As I as I like to do in all of my fake games that I've run, I like to get input from the players as to what sort of things they want to see in the game. Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm running the game for my enjoyment and for your enjoyment. So if I can get some ideas from you guys as to what you're expecting to see, why would I not want to put it in the game? <clears throat> Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so I'm going to put give you an easy one. Um, I'd like to see something that's not a planet, not a moon, just it's a small station. It's it's um, It could be a gas station. It could be a fast food place. Just some, so some convenience stop spot in space that, you know, is, that is completely artificial, that is not you know, put on already on. Okay. I, I just think I like stuff like that because it adds to the sort of realism of the world. It makes the world seem, well, this is a practical place. People would come by here. They would need this. You know, I had a thought um, kind of as a, to an encounter possibility like or a, perhaps even a setting aspect. Um, but obviously we're kind of being sent almost as a, as a rescue team to find this other ship. But I wonder if we're the only ones searching for this gate. Obviously, the hegemony has kind of kept the tight lid on it, probably, but, you know, not everyone is uh, going to keep a closed mouth, and there's going to be a lot of people out there with an interest in, in finding this place, so uh, nope. I wouldn't mind there being perhaps uh, people following us or, you know, people attacking us or um, trying to get <laughs> us to, it... to, to the place kind of a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't give them plot ideas. That's too much already. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, he asked for it, so this is what he's getting. <laughs> That's it. It, it. It's all right. I, I can shoe, shoe on an extra half a dozen encounters in there, Rob. I'm sure. There you go. Yeah, we got time, right? We got 12 hours. Session, right? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> okay, so does anyone else have any ideas as to things you either would or perhaps wouldn't like to see in the game? I want to see an evil space wizard. Probably Perhaps a space, he's he's space or wizard. Perhaps he's looking for his dark that, god, and he needs us to lead him to the gate. Out. Going back to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could work a lot. It, it, I could easily see just just traveling through space. You have an encounter with a warlord who's also yeah, a exactly. Uh, safe space is not that safe. Well, it probably has safe areas and unsafe neighborhoods, you know, like that. Yeah, Safe-ish, yeah. And that's it. Well, in all the time that the the various races have left Homeworld, no life form has ever been encountered that did not originate on Homeworld. So when they got to, like, these planets, they didn't, like, bump into aliens or things like that. The only, as far as it's commonly believed, the only races out there are the ones that joined the Exodus from Homeworld. So it's not likely we're going to run into 18-foot-tall dinosaur people. It's not likely, not impossible. Right. I have to admit, 18-foot uh, dinosaur people weren't something I had in mind for the uh, for the session, but if someone's particularly interested in pursuing that as a plot thread, I've no objections to... Uh... I, I can think of better ideas. You want to throw them away later? <laughs> Oh, we're going to have to fight the Triceratons. <laughs> the Triceratons. <laughs> no. Okay, so we've got everyone's aspects and concepts up on the Google Docs. 
So, as I say, if anyone does want to tweak any of those to reflect a, a greater knowledge or association with one of the other PCs, that's probably something that's worth doing at this stage. You certainly don't have to. I'm fine. I don't think it's that important since, um, you know, it's not like you need a contrived reason for us to all know each other and get all the information. Even, yeah. Besides, I think what would be better, work even better is that, uh, like, if something were to, like, say we were to do a follow-up for this, I think the exper this experience would be the thing that would tie us all together later in a, in a, in a, other, in a other session, you know, like, yeah. so uh, something where, like, a milestone, we can adjust an aspect to, to reflect that kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, quite true. Okay, so in terms of approaches, the game uses the standard six approaches from Faith Accelerated, which are careful, clever, forceful, flashy, quick, and sneaky. Players get to pick one that is rated at good, which is plus three, two that are rated at fair, which is plus two, one at average, which is plus one, and one at mediocre, which is plus zero. There's actually two at plus one. My apologies. If we're going by the A to C uh, standard. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Can you just repeat what the numbers were again? Three, two, two, one, one, zero. Okay, it's two twos, two ones, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said earlier, just before we started recording, each species also has a favoured approach, and it's worth putting like an X by that approach on your character sheet. Now, for the humans, that's flashy. For the elves, that's clever. For the goblins, oh, it's sneaky. And what else have we got? For the orcs, it's quick. Now, that doesn't give you any particular bonus. What it means is, effectively, if, you, if you're rolling on that approach and you get a roll that's less than zero, the roll counts as a zero. So there's a limit to how badly you're going to do it a roll on your favoured approach. Okay. Nobody is that stupid. <laughs> yeah, at least zero. So how does it work if you have a favoured approach? What bonus does that give? Well, like I say, it doesn't give you an actual bonus, but let's say um, you're playing an elf, aren't you? Mm-hmm. So yours is clever. So let's say you're attempting to puzzle something out and you're making a clever roll. If you if your roll was anything below zero, it would get bumped up to a zero. Okay, cool. So the minimum you can roll on your favourite approach is a zero. Yeah, so you'll always medium. get a certain level of roll. You're at least mediocre at that. Yeah. Approach. It doesn't mean that that necessarily has to be your best statted approach. It just means that you're never going to get a really abysmal role at that approach. Which is interesting to me, because if you have that as your highest stat, then you probably wouldn't get a really abysmal role anyway. Yeah. I think that's part of the reason... I mean, I don't know for sure. I think that's part of the reason why they did it like that, because I think if they'd have just given you a flat bonus to a particular approach... The, the sort of impetus would be to just bang your highest approach yeah, and I think yeah. it's a ridiculously high level approach whereas this way it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to bang your highest level approach in the favoured one but it also gives you a little bit of an advantage to like balance out potentially getting a really bad roll Okay, so has everyone got an idea of what they want to do in terms of their approaches? What, what your just, thing is yep, going to be? Yeah, I've already written we it just down. Just need Johan's name, character name. Yeah, working on it. <clears throat> okay, if you guys want to stick your approaches on the document, you can do. You don't have to. Okay, I'm I'm fine doing it. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Same. I'm just putting asterisks. Next to... Mm -hmm. Okay, cool.
Okay, in terms of why are you doing that? In terms of stunts and refresh, you start off with three free stunts and three refresh. So you'll all be starting off with three fate points, and you also get three stunts in addition to that. Now, stunts in Fate Accelerated work in two potential ways. You can either take a stunt that says, because of, or whatever the in-character reason is, I gain a plus two when I use a particular approach to do a particular action. So you could say, well, because I'm a, a licensed practitioner in the Elven Medical College, I get a plus two when I cleverly attempt to staunch someone's wounds. Um, along those lines. Well, I'm just curious about that. See, when I was DMing, I was always a little bit fussier that you had to be fairly specific in where the stunt could be used, because otherwise, like with the doctor example you gave, couldn't he virtually always get at least a plus four? I am a doctor, plus I have this stunt, therefore I'm going to get at least a plus four to the role. Like, it's, it sounds like something you could use just about every time you're applying medicine. Well, that, that's what I said. This, uh, look, I'm sorry, John. Let me jump in real yeah, quick. Perfect. So on. I'm not saying what you pick. I'm just saying you got to oh, be yeah, careful. Yeah. So like, the one I made earlier, uh, it's specific to a type of action and a type of approach. So it's a quick approach only. It's to creating advantages and only when it's medical emergency medical care. So in other words, you have to be like dying or bleeding out or whatever that kind of thing. You know what I mean? So those are the yeah. narrative. So that's how the stunt works. Like when you say it, you gotta say, you gotta pick an approach, you gotta pick an action, and you gotta pick a circumstance essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great example. That's exactly. Yeah, exactly yeah. You, you are right, Rob. If if something was allowed to take place and it was very generic, yeah. it, it wouldn't work. That that's why you have to sort of, you do have to be quite specific about the circumstances your stunt can be used on. You couldn't just say, oh well, because I because I'm practiced with a weapon. Whenever I forcefully attack with a weapon, I get a plus two because it's too vague, it's too broad. But, you could but if you said anyway. sword, for example, then that would that wouldn't be that'd be better essentially. Yeah, because because feasibly you could be disarmed at some point. You might not have a sword to hand, or you might be using a gun instead, and therefore your stunt wouldn't be applicable. I have a question about a, a stunt that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. I'm considering a stunt, a once per session stunt, to yeah. kind of go along with the triage one that I had, uh, that would allow me to clear a mild consequence. Is that something that's I, so, you, you can do it in fake core, but you depending so upon how you structure it. Once per session, you can clear a mild consequence. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. That's why? All right, cool. Yeah. I just have to come up with a good name for that. <laughs> that, that. That's a good example of the the second way that stunts can work. You yeah. can either have the plus two bonus, as we've just talked about, or you can say once per session, because of this in-character reason, I can do X. So for just to give a random example for Tashif's character, he might say, because I'm a, a goblin space archaeologist, once per session, I can ask a question to the GM related to the history of an item and receive an answer. Um, I, I just realized that literally all of us have clever as our highest stat. Well, that's nice reason we're on board. But, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. You're obviously the smart posse. Yeah. We're smart. We're, we're, yeah, we're um, careful, clever. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Yeah, I, I'm just saying it might not be a good thing in terms of... Yeah, you're probably right. I, 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 it just went with my character concept. So that's why I picked yeah. an elf, which also gave me double the reason. This is also a good reason for having these all of this written down on the, the Google document, because you can have a look at it, and you can see if there's any areas where... You well, I'm cl my, mine's clever, so... I mean, mine's careful, not clever, so... I'm We're, we're covered in the careful department, at least. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. My second one is clever. My 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 two fairs are clever and quick, but my my top one's careful. Yeah, I I went with clever because I wanted to basically be that character that tries to like think its way out of situations, yeah. even combat ones, rather than directly forcefully approaching. 
Okay, so does anyone else have any ideas or questions they want to ask about stunts they may potentially be taking? Bear in mind, you each get three of them. Do you have to okay. pick three? Can you go one and have five three points to share with, or does it have to be three and three? But by default, you have to pick three and then have the, the three refresh. If someone, if someone potentially really doesn't want to take three stunts, I'm quite amenable to you switching it over to refresh. I don't see that as being a massive problem, to be perfectly honest. On the flip side of that, though, you could take more than one, than three stunts if you pay it with refresh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know. So if you want to take four stunts and two refresh or whatever, that's absolutely... Yeah, exactly. But basically, all, all you're doing is you, you're trading on how much versatility you want as opposed to how much reliability you want. The stunts, you always know what they do. They're always reliable. They do a set thing, boom, that's it. Whereas with your fate points, you've got more flexibility, but it obviously relies on you being able to invoke an aspect. Okay. Uh, John D., what race are you playing? I am a human. Thanks. I think I'm the only human on the crew, too, which is uh, which actually works because I, my high concept is a famous hegemony physician, so I'm like I'm almost like the poster child representative of the hegemony, even though I'm not necessarily that poster childish kind of thing. So, yeah. Maybe that's why I got this shit assignment. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so does anyone else have any questions or things they want to ask about stunts? Or are you all happy with how they work? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm reading up on them because I haven't played Fate before, but uh, we don't have to spend time on that. Yep. Well, that's not. I mean, if if you want to, if you have any ideas as to what sort of roughly you want your stunts to do, we can probably advise as to how that would translate into the rules. That's not a problem. So, if you've got any ideas for effects you want, but you're not sure, how, you want to just throw them out there, and we can help you with the sort of system side of them. That's not a problem. I mean, what sort of yeah. things were you wanting your character to be able to do? Uh, well, a bunch of the meta alteration stuff uh, for the engine room, I guess, mainly. But um, so with the focus on raw magic, it's let me pull up the section on that. So. Uh, yeah, in order to represent your magical training, you have to take a focus that is a stunt you work out with the yeah. VM. Yeah, so, because, uh, hmm. okay, here we go. So, alteration. So, it says here, alteration focuses the examples, the three ones. Mm -hmm. um, I'm perfectly happy with the meta alteration focus there. So, is that a stunt in itself? Like, yeah, yeah, you would just take a stunt that says meta alteration. Yeah. Because part, yeah. part of the thing of to represent the cost of learning magic is that you effectively have this like inert stunt that doesn't give you a bonus in the same way as other stunts, but it allows you yeah. to use your magic. Right. So I'll take one of those. Yeah, I mean, we can move forward. I can work this out. Okay, that's not a problem. Have you given any thoughts to what you want your stunts to be to chief? Um, okay, I got one that's plus two to creating advantages with my special gun. Um, and I have another one that's plus two to clever rolls that relates to that pertain to lore about the gods. Yeah. Assuming that might be in hand and helpful, and hmm, I'm not sure what I want the third one to be. Well, as is always the case with fate games, you do have the option of leaving some of them blank and then filling them in during mm. the session. Now, obviously, you're not going to get quite as much opportunity to do that because it's a one shot rather than a a, a campaign. But that's still there as an option. Or you, if you didn't, if you really couldn't think of one, you could potentially, as Rob was saying, trade it in for an extra point of refresh. Alright. Um. Hmm. I don't think I'm sure there's something that I'll frequently do. 
Mm-hmm. That's not a problem. Right. So you guys have got uh, obviously like a, a day or two to think about it after this hangout. Anyway, I mean, the the main point of this is just to establish what sort of characters you guys are playing, what your roles were on the ship, which was pretty much covered. We have obviously got the name of your ship, the Oracle that Jenny suggested. I've given you all the basics of what you're going out there for. You're there to, as the backup for this deep Aether vessel that discovered this God Gate, as it's being called. Apparently just lying inert, floating in the, the deep Aether. I have a, an idea for a stunt I'd like to run by you. Okay, go ahead. Something like um, use this stunt to carefully help um, calm a, a. I want to be like in a negotiation session. I want to be able to use my the sort of calmness of my voice to help calm the other person down and defuse a situation, or at least potentially. Uh, okay. Again, that, that potentially sounds like another sort of plus two to create an advantage role um, to me. So, for instance, you could. You could say, oh, well, I, I, in negotiation situations, I gain a plus two to carefully create an advantage. You could create something like a charm. Calming aura. Or, yeah. You know. so, so you could effectively put like a free invoke of an, of an advantage on someone you're negotiating with. Then if it does come down to like some form of social role, you could say, well, because I've got the advantage of he's hanging on my every word, I'm going to spend that free invoke to give me like a plus two to that social role. Gotcha. So okay. yeah, I go with um in a social situation, I gain a plus two to carefully create an, a a calming advantage when I'm negotiating with someone or something along those lines. Okay. Okay, Jenny, have you got any thoughts about the stunts for your character? Yep, I'm just tweaking one of them, um, but uh. One of them is, because I'm a wielder of frost magic, I get a plus two when I quickly attack when undetected by an enemy. Okay. Um, Because I have no fear, once per game session, I can use my level-headedness to detect an enemy's weakness. Okay, that sounds quite cool. That that sounds to me like a variant of another stunt in Fate Core, where if you talk to someone for a certain length of time, you can discover what one of their aspects is. Mm Mm-hmm. So for you, it might be like a case of you after you've been like looking around, you gain like a bonus to discover what someone's trouble aspect is or something along those mm-hmm. lines. Um, and I've, I've phrased it like this, but I might change it a little bit because I'm cold and calculating. I get a plus two when I cleverly overcome malfunctions with the oracle. So like any kind of uh, me- um, not mechanical, but like control malfunction or something like that. That's cool. I don't see a problem with that. Okay. All right. So it makes sense. Hmm. Would I, would I be able to have like um? And I'm not sure if this is narrow enough, but I, I want to be better at uh, get maybe like an extra bonus when I invoke uh, advantages that I create. Just so there's m- more incentive for me to. Create an advantage before attacking and constantly break them. So you're talking about um, you get the bonus to actually create the advantage or a bonus when the advantage is invoked. Like um, you get the plus two when you create the advantage, but I'm thinking there's also another situational one where when I when I am invoking an advantage, I gain an additional plus two. I think that might be a little bit powerful for a stunt, to be honest. Well, right. well, I have a thought on that. What question. about... Um, okay, I'll just... Say, what about I was going to say, um, well, well, John, John said he's got an idea for that, so which yeah, one? Yeah, my thought on that would be to simply say, well, basically when you're creating... or you're, you're trying to get advantage on someone else's aspect, you're just simply rolling create advantage anyway to do it. So just make it so that you're getting a plus two when you, you know, whatever approach you want to use, create an advantage in the situation that you want to describe it as. So, in other words, um, say it's um, you want to take advantage of a mechanical weakness that you that you see, for example, then you can just mm-hmm. say, you know, plus two to cleverly create advantage when 
exploiting a mechanical weakness, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, because obviously, if you when you create an advantage, if you do it with style, okay. i.e., you succeed by like three or more, you get an extra one anyway. You get you yeah. gain an extra free invoke of that advantage anyway. Yeah. So by bumping up your score for creating an advantage, you make it more likely you could trigger it multiple times. Yeah. I, I I already got something like that though. The plus two degree advantages of the space gun. But perhaps you could take something similar but for like a different circumstance though, rather than exactly. using your, exactly. your gun. Mm. You have to understand okay, that I'll, with the uh, I'll think about that. If they accelerate the the stunts are a little more simplistic and narrow. You really only have two conditions for stunts, not like with Hit Core where you can have like there's different approaches to making stunts. Here, there's only two, so okay. you're gonna have quite a little bit of overlap. Wait, what, what was the second one that wasn't a plus two? Basically, you can, you can do something once per session that's a like a cool thing, or that kind of slightly okay. okay. The rules or gives you a, an even more powerful thing. Yes, yeah, so, like, like the one I suggested earlier if, um, as a potential one for your character might be once per session when I'm examining an ancient artifact, I can ask the GM a question about it and receive an answer to represent your knowledge. So you could say, I'm using my student who created this device, and I'll be like, well, you've seen things similar to this before, you believe it to be created by blah, blah, blah. Okay. Which, as anyone knows, blah, blah, blah is the name of an ancient uh, artisan. Okay, okay. But yeah, basically, like, like John was saying, the second type of stunt is basically because of this narrative reason or because of some part of my character background, once per session, I can do this. I mean, I, I've used it in games where I've got one of them playing Wild West games. I've had a stunt where I was like, because I've got a, a bond with my horse once per session, I can escape from a scene by sort of whistling my horse and jumping on it and disappearing into the distance. All right. So, John, can I just verify that this sounds uh, good for you? On um, this is a, my second song. Uh, it's called Patch 'em Up Quick because I can patch them up quick. Once per session, I can provide such fine medical care that I clear a mild consequence immediately. Yeah, that sounds absolutely fine to me. Now, is that because the, basically the way I want to apply it though is that it can be on anybody I can really give medical care to. So. Once per session, is that going to be all right? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay. So in case I get shot and uh, I get shot real bad, I can't let the doc die, and I'm the only one that can fix myself. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like in the the end of Serenity when when Simon gets shot. It's like okay, yeah, but there's no one else there that can really uh, fix him though. <laughs> yeah, that all sounds fun. No problems with that. We had the appropriate stunt. <laughs> Okay, so does any since we seem to have got the the broad strokes of the characters sort of worked out and the stats as far as they go, does anyone have any additional questions they want to ask about their characters or anything they want to clear up? Anything they want to ask about the background of the, um, the one game? question about the background. Is it more egalitarian than what I would imagine it was on Homeworld? It do does the goblin and the orc have to they be looked down upon in general? Not not so much to look down upon. I mean, in the in the royal hegemony, humans are pretty much in control because they were basically the race that was able to like get their shit together the most when the the exodus took place, and they they've got pretty much a lockdown on the Aether ship technology. There are fringe sort of versions of the races, you know, like the sort of savage orc raiders and there's various other things like that which are obviously enemies of the hegemony and independence alike but not necessarily looked down on to be honest it is a bit more egalitarian than you might expect from a traditional fantasy world okay that's cool. the uh, the SCU do they take orders from the hegemony or do their is there are they supreme in any Anyway, they're, they're, or... they're, te they're technically an independent sort of entity, almost like a sort of corporation, but they're so sort of they they benefit from working closely with the hegemony, and the hegemony benefits from working closely with them. It's a little bit like the um, 
if you think of like one of them as being like the church and the other as being like the sort of the royals, by cooperating, they both benefit from that relationship. And they, they both work very closely together, but technically they are separate entities. So one can't order the other kind of thing. Can they? They, they can't I mean, be direct orders. I mean, the technically, the, the laws of the land, really. technically, the royal hegemony couldn't just go up to the SCU and say, "Right, you are doing this." However, what they'd probably do is they'd probably suggest a joint venture and how it's going to benefit the SCU. And if it is going to benefit them, they'd probably go along with it because they've got a very profitable working relationship with each other. Right. So there's a sense of devoutness, divineness to the SCU. Like you say, it is church-like in many ways. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if you think about it, before the disappearance of the gods, a lot of the the magic was in the hands of the the people who were devoted to the divine. And that has been a very big impetus for the SCU wanting to discover what's happened to the gods, because if they could somehow regain that power, that would make them even more of a force to be reckoned with. Does anyone else have any suggestions for things they'd either like to see or not like to see in the session? Well, dead gods would like to see some of those. Okay. I would not like to see a dead me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure if you ask Tashif, he'll quite happily back up the fact that my fake games are very non-legal. Unless you want to be killed. Yes, in which case they're incredibly lethal. How many, how many characters did you go through in Jade Punk? Did you? Three. Oh, last one survived. But you know, you know the one main thing. I finally killed more people than Yoshida. <laughs> That's true. Yep. <laughs> yep, you did. I, I should have made that clear at the start of the campaign. This isn't a competition between you and Matthew to see how many NPCs you can kill. <laughs> Are you sure about that, John? That's always like, I, having, having seen sort of like the devastated like face of like Matthew, like every time his character invertedly killed like a load of people. Yeah, but Matthew obviously won the award for bromance. Oh yeah, definitely. Like the, the it, it wasn't really any competition, was it? Really wooed as well. He woos them in and then kills them. He was he was the only one who ostensibly got a happy ending where he, he settled down with his new wife at the end and then he sort of you, decided you, to wander back off into the um the city and leave it all behind. I particularly enjoy the scene at the end where he's like his wife was like, Oh well, I've just given birth to like our, our our baby daughter, you know, you could like stay here and we've got a good life, you can like forget all about cow sow and he's like, No, but I've I've got to go back. <laughs> My character had yeah. a semi-happy ending. He just ended up no, being an old person. Yeah, you did end up being an old person living in your home village, having led these refugees there yeah, to like a place yeah. of safety. So, mm -hmm. if anything, I think you all sort of had a happy ending. Uh, well, well, I, I just flat out did have a happy ending, apart from having my leg injured. Yeah. <laughs> That's Suki's last laugh. Indeed, I thought the um, the two player characters sort of duking it out in like the final scenes was quite entertaining. <laughs> they had a dread game like that. It, was, it came down to two players basically. I, I must get around. Of us is not I have a copy of it. But... Okay, so Jenny, is there anything you would like to see or I'm not see? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Um. Hmm. I quite like the idea of either a small um, elite organization um, who dislikes us for some reason, or one recurring character who doesn't like us. How recurring can they be? 
This is a one like shot. A, uh, well, I can... necromancer that wants our that wants the ship to see his. Dark I can think of, but I can think of some extremists who might be um, terrified that no, 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 we can't breach this void. It'll you know it'll destroy the galaxy. Like people who didn't want the uh, large hydrogen collider to start up because they thought exactly. it would destroy the Earth. Yeah, I could see you have a group like that that's right. definitely against what we're trying to achieve. Okay. Sort of an anti-space environment, or a yeah. space environmentalist group or something. Or like the, op- <laughs> the opposite, like uh, Unitarians from Dead Space who really want us to bring those ancient alien artifacts back. Or they, they want to be the first. They don't want anyone else to get there before them. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at either extremists opposing the mission or god fanatics who... Who want the return of the divine? Or both? Why not? Why yeah, choose? Both, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go in there and get it. Then we're going to keep your daughter hostage. Get back. <laughs> okay, so I think that pretty much wraps it up in terms of sort of character creation. If everyone's happy with the characters they've got and what everyone else is playing. There's any I've got a, a Sorry, idea for a third stunt. I'd like to bounce off yeah, you. So ahead. here it is. So there it is. I just put it in chat. So okay. Once per game, you can use his knowledge and instinct to know the correct direction towards any yeah, that's perfect. location. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a perfect example of that yeah, type. Perfect example of that type of stunt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I do have to say, I will say this because uh, John, between Dresden Files and like uh, Newer Fate. I love the mechanics of Newer Fate better, but I do love the, the Dresden Files books. That's why yeah. I'm so... I can't wait to uh, for Fate Ex- uh, Dresden Files Accelerator to come out. That's going to be hot, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, because everything about the, the setting that I love, but uh, better rules. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll I, I, I don't... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, I don't quite like all the rules for like spellcasting and supernatural yeah, abilities. yeah. yeah. Like for example, if you had wings, it has like all these. Like, you can fly over its own and blah blah blah. And I'm just like, just say you have wings and all the advantages that logically come from it. Yeah. It's all you need in the fate. Really. It's it's still too little. It's still a little bit too crunchy for being a fate game. Yeah. But I think that if you just smooth some of that out, they do all that in the new stuff in the newer system. So when you bring that over, I think it's just going to make the game even. Better than it already is, well, you know. Well, I think it's obvious that um, Dresden Files was a sort of slightly pre-fate call. It was absolutely, yeah. And mm-hmm. um, you can see, so I mean, I haven't read it now. I can see where they've sort of looked at things from it and gone, "All right, we'll streamline that." We're gonna streamline that, and yep, we're gonna change this. Yep, exactly. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, likewise, I mean, I, I've I finally like made the plunge and bought the, the two fakes. Uh, sorry, the two um, Dresden Files books because the chiefs were in the game of it soon for us. But I'm enjoying reading the books, but yeah, I can't wait for Dresden Files Accelerated to come out. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to getting on. I can't wait to your game then, man. I, I love Dresden Files, so it's, I'm, I'm glad to see someone else uh, running it. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, um, Tashif's taken over this sort of slot I used to do, Jade Punk, and he's going to... Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, gonna to relax yeah. and have, a, uh, have some time as a player for a bit. And, yeah, uh, fantastic. Awesome. Get to wear one hand at a time instead of ten. Instead of twenty, yeah. So I'm still I'm still running a Star Wars campaign, Rob. So I've still got things. To do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was I was actually talking with Rob um a few days ago, and I th- I think I have a pretty good um opening case for you guys. What was it that the others decided to play? I can't remember. So no, I was uh, Matthew the was undecided because he was new to Dresden Files and didn't know what to pick. Jenny wanted to be a white court vampire. Yes. Cool. Not Matthew Bryan, were you talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, he's, he's not new to Dresden Files at all. I, I know, I know. I was joking. He's been to Dresden Files all the time. Uh, his, problem is he, his problem is he knows too much. He can't decide what he wants to play this time. <laughs> I'm so tempted to just uh, do things like if a random NPC dies, just now that ends the story of James Dresden. Can't continue on my line anymore. 
I, I can't I can't seriously believe you're saying that Matt Matthews undecided about his character, man, to be perfectly honest. But uh... yeah. If he doesn't decide soon, he'll have to play a hash brown. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> like I said, my only problem at the minute is, as I was saying earlier, I definitely decided, oh, you know, Knight of the Fake or quality. And then I've been looking at all the other supernaturals, and I'm like, oh, I'd quite like to play one of them as well. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I'd quite, like to, I'd quite like to play one of those as it's well. It's got a really strong mythos. Yeah. Which is the best thing I, about books. I, I do hope you actually do go for the Summer Night. It was summer, right? Yeah, that's what I was originally thinking of. I'm thinking about. I'm thinking at the minute of going for like a, a summer court night who used to be a nightclub owner. Okay. No reason okay. you can't do something like that, yeah. In fact, actually, it's funny. Uh, in in the books, at one point, uh, to kind of like dig at Harry a little. Um, a spoiler alert for the books, but it's a small one. Uh, She's saying, well, if you won't take up the job, uh, then I'll just get your brother to do it. And she's like, he's not even that human. She's like, ah, he's in love. That's human enough for me. <laughs> so, you know, as long as you're, as long as you're kind of human, sort of human, you can fill okay, the job. Okay, okay. Did you spoil the book that I was just reading? No, oh, which book are you in? Small Favor. Was that in Small Favor? I'm not sure. Mab was that Mab that showed might up have in actually been. In, it might have been. It's either that or a slightly earlier one. That might have been in White Knight. Actually, he she says that, but I'm not sure. I haven't. I haven't read through the whole series in a year, or so I need to uh, do a reread before the uh, next one comes out. Okay, sure guys. So um, yes. before I wrap up the broadcast, does anyone have anything else they want to ask or anything else they need settling for their characters? Uh, can I take a look at my um, stunts? I can get okay. a and, um, document. Yeah, there. Would you be, would you be cool with me having a stunt that was just plus two when using my element gun? Yeah, you you would have to specify a an approach that you were going to use. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have okay. Have um, to, and you'd have to specify what sort of action you're going to be using. So it'd be like you know. Oh, okay. Um, I get it. Plus two when attack yeah. when carefully attacking with my element gun or whatever. Okay. Okay. Uh, I might think about that. Have one then. like that. I'll show you how I wrote it. I have I have one that's exactly like this. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay, okay, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't see any problem with them, Johannes. Okay. That's fine. I, I like the overcompensating browbeat or one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that looks all good. Oh, Rob has a good one. Recklessly, yeah. Mm. That's her to she. Okay, so and obviously if anyone comes with any more ideas they want to add to that Google document, obviously just keep hold of the link and you can s stick your additional ideas on there, that's not a problem. What I'll do is when the session actually starts, I'll post the link in the chat again so we can all have that document up so we can like check people's aspects, etc. I'll be relying on you guys to track your own character sheets most of the time. I'll quite happily say, you know, I'm giving you a fate point for this compel if you take it, etc. But I'll be relying on you guys to track all that information. Obviously, I'll have the document open so I've got your your aspects there. So if you do change your aspects or want to change them before the game, please make sure they're altered and they're correct on that Google Docs. That's what I'll be using to make compels against you. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have this planned already, John, but if it doesn't mess up your plans, I'd like to start at least before we launch, before we leave, or even if it's as we're about to leave. Well, what I was actually thinking... You're on your way. What I was actually thinking, Rob, is um, since you mentioned you wanted to be at a sort of convenient stop or some sort of artificial sort of way station, is it might be a good place to start off while your ship's being fueled, you know, checked over, etc. You okay. have like a stop off just to make sure everything's like all, all systems functional. Before yeah, the last stop the before we leave, we leave this homogeneous space, essentially. Yeah. 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 La last last fuel station for eighteen parsecs. 
exactly yeah so i'm imagining like the um the sort of aether equivalent of like you know those um american gas stations where there's like two gas pumps and a little shop and very little else pretty old had a very creepy chair. guy at the counter had a creepy creepy vibe <laughs> to it yeah yeah and that's it so i'm imagining sort of like a space version of that yeah or maybe maybe it's like the ultimate unfazable guy it doesn't matter what comes in it could be a 10 foot tall green alien spewing stuff out of his oh like yeah what do you want tentacles you again oh <laughs> Okay, so if no one else has any further questions, I will, and everyone's happy with the characters, I will end the broadcast there. I'm happy to chat for a little bit afterwards. But is everyone happy with what they've got so far and knows sort of what we're doing? Yeah, it worked out yeah. well. Thank you. Okay, cool. In which case, thanks very much, guys, and I shall end the broadcast there.